from Cincinnati. Sorry for the delay. We had some technical difficulties. Uh, we hope that we have solved. Um, hopefully today will be a relatively short agenda. Some good news. The city of Cincinnati's yard waste collection will, in fact, resume on May 4th. Um, traditionally, yard, work, yard waste collection begins the first week of April. However, due to issues related to the uh, coronavirus, uh, we suspended it until June. But the Department of Public Services has reassigned select staff and made several operational changes to bring this back sooner. We know that we all want it back. Bulk items will remain suspended until June 1st. The stay-at-home order from Governor DeWine has likely given residents the opportunity to do a lot of spring cleaning, resulting in higher volumes of regular trash and yard waste. Residents shooting to participate in the yard waste program are reminded of the following guidelines. Yard waste will be collected every other week as the same as recycling. So this is how we did it last year. Uh, yard waste must be properly prepared in paper bags or can be clearly labeled yard waste. Loose yard waste such as grass or leaves should be in containers that have lids or in bags that are closed to prevent blowing. Sticks and branches may be tied in bundles of no more than three feet length and two, inch, or two feet diameter. No tape, plastic rope, or metal wire uh, may be used. Yard waste containers and bags exceeding 25 pounds will not be collected, so 25 pounds is the limit. For more information about the yard waste program, uh, please see our website. But again, it'll come back uh, May 4th. Um, and so at this time, I'd like to ask Health Commissioner Melba Moore to give our daily update. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Cranley. We have today 276 confirmed cases. One hundred and thirty six of those cases are male, one hundred and forty are female. There are currently forty two individuals hospitalized, eighteen female, twenty four male. I'm sorry, eighteen male, twenty four female. Eight confirmed deaths, five male, and three female. And we have a total of 98 individuals who have recovered. 54 male, 44 female. Total of deaths is eight. And we have a turnaround time of two days for our test results. In our health centers, we have tested a total of 70 individuals. 12 are positive, And seven are pending cases. Of that breakdown, we know that 13 are male. 38 female, and that's up counting the 51 that are negative. As it relates to the positives, we have seven females, five males. Racial breakdown for the positives, four black, six white, one unknown, and one Asian. Just to run through the state numbers, there's a total of 12,516 confirmed cases of COVID, 491 deaths, 798 ICU admissions. The median age is 51. Total of 2,653 hospitalizations. That's all I have for today. 
Thank you, uh, Commissioner Moore. Uh, now we have a couple of uh, more fun and lighthearted uh, elements. Uh, the Greater Cincinnati Waterworks has been prepared even before the coronavirus uh, for pandemics and to respond to any sort of emergency to ensure that we will continue to have clean water. They are accustomed to training for emergencies and working hard to ensure our region has clean water no matter what. Check out this video, which shows the capacity, which luckily we haven't had to use yet, uh, to allow our workers to shelter at the water plants to make sure that our water plants will, in fact, continue to operate no matter what. Hello, I am Kathy Bernardino Bailey, Executive Director of Greater Cincinnati Waterworks, and I'd like to speak to you today about how we are maintaining our operations here at the water utility as we plan for a worst case scenario. And this is a situation where we have a tiny village at our treatment plant for our employees to live there if needed so that they can make sure that the treatment plant and all the operations that we have are still running so we have a plentiful supply to the region. Mark Raffenberg, superintendent of the supply division here at the Richard Miller treatment plant in California, Ohio. This trailer park that we've actually set up here. Uh, we have 24 trailers that we brought on site here at Richard Miller Treatment Plant. And the intent would be to house those staff uh, for two week shifts here uh, at a time uh, and then rotate out with another uh, crew working also for two weeks at a time. So the way the trailers are set up is that each member of the crew will have their own individual trailer to uh, live and reside in. Um, they've uh, each trailer has been set up with a blanket, pillow, inflatable mattress, towels, set up a safe space to, and clean space to, to live. We had to run, figure out a way to run power uh, to each and every one of these facilities for both air conditioning, heat, and lighting, and any other uh, needs that the individual may have. As you can see, we are prepared. We're prepared for the day-to-day -day operations, but we're also prepared for worst-case scenario, and so it's important to let everyone know that, that that is the case for us. And our leaders certainly allow us to, to do everything that we need to do in the utility. So I wanna thank Mayor Cranley. Certainly wanna thank uh, City Manager Dehaney, all the employees at Waterworks for everything that you're doing um, and continuing to do to make sure that we have a plentiful supply of water in the region. I don't know about uh, you guys, but um when I see those images of the trailer park at, at the uh, water treatment facility on Kellogg uh, in California, um, Cincinnati, California, of course, one of our great 52 neighborhoods, uh, it's pretty shocking, similar to seeing beds put up at the convention center. This is not something I ever thought we would need. Uh, but California, of course, will always accept the new residents and if Lebos is doing takeout, I'm sure they would appreciate it if it becomes necessary. Having said that, um, we're not using those facilities now, but uh, we just wanted the public to know, and I've been saying this for a while, that we, will, we do have the ability to make sure that water will continue and we are set up uh, if the situation were to require it. Now, moving on to even more lighthearted fun, uh, we are still going strong with the Stay at Home Challenge. We have two videos today to share. Uh, we've received lots of submissions uh, from the Nor Northwest School District and uh, wanting to send a message to the Taylor Tigers. Thank you for what you're doing to keep students encouraged. We also received, received a video from Melissa Meldon as well. Please continue to submit videos at stay at home at, or stay home at cincinnati-oh.gov or by hashtagging hashtag stay home Cincinnati or hashtag in this together Cincinnati on your profiles. So here are today's videos.
right. Well, that was great. Thank you for the spirit. And um, I can't help but think of our uh, Bengals and hope that they'll be playing in the fall when I see all those Tigers. Um, and uh, just friendly reminders to consider giving to our United Way General uh, Greater Cincinnati Foundation Fund by texting RAPID to 91999. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, do we have any questions today from uh, Channel 5, WLWT? Okay. Uh, how about Cincinnati Enquirer? Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon. I was wondering, under what circumstances uh, could you see having to use the trailers for the waterworks employees. I think we would have to have a uh, what a, a level three surge. I think is the official term. Uh, I think the unofficial term is a lot of waterworks employees that are either uh, are testing positive and or their family members testing positive. Have any waterworks employees po tested positive? Not yet. <laughs> nope. Not at this time. Okay, uh, question from uh, the business courier. Mayor, uh, with the May 1st date to start to reopen the state, I'm curious whether you think Cincinnati and Hamilton County are ready to start reopening, and if so, what do you think are the first things that can open back up? And then this might be for Commissioner Moore and for you. Do we have enough testing to capacity to, to make a, a reopening possible at this point? And then I have one other question after that. Well, uh, let me say that I think that um, based on my conversations uh, daily with the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, I'm relatively confident that um, the state is going to reopen uh, slowly and safely, meaning that, um, you know, it's, it's going to prolong the economic pain, uh, but uh, I don't think there's going to be a radical opening on May 1st. I think that uh, manufacturing and things of that nature that have a protocol in place and a plan approved by the state to be able to operate safely in, uh, with physical distancing and masks and gloves and things of that nature will be allowed uh, on a rolling basis to open up. Uh, I, I think we're all anxious for those guidelines uh, to be very clear, so we're not giving people misinformation. But I think that, uh, that the state will continue to follow the, the best medical uh, opinions and science uh, going forward. I, I do think, big picture, two additional things are necessary. Um, unfortunately, until there's a vaccine, the way we do work is going to change essentially permanently until such time we have a vaccine. Um, and so going back to work, whether it's quick or slow, is going to be very different than what our life was like uh, two months ago, uh, at least in the state of Ohio. The second uh, thing is absolutely we need more tests. Um, and I, I don't hear any disagreement uh, about that from uh, the state uh, and I hear it everywhere across the country um, that if you, the best way uh, for us to reopen this economy is to have mass testing, mass contact tracing, and isolation of people that are sick. And so um, it doesn't mean that is the way we're going to reopen uh, on, in the state of Ohio, but that is the way we should reopen. And uh, and I candidly believe that the state believe, agrees with me on that. The unfortunate fact, though, is that the tests can only ramp up if the reagent, which for those of you who don't know what that term means, which I didn't know what it meant a couple weeks ago, it's a liquid, and I'm not a chemistry major, but it basically when you take a swab from somebody, you take it and put it in some sort of laboratory Petri dish or whatever, and you add this liquid, which they call a reagent, and somehow it does its magic, you know, smoke comes up or whatever, and then it tells you whether you have COVID or not. Uh, I'm simplifying. Um, 
that liquid is necessary to, to the test. And it needs to be mass produced and mass manufactured. And uh, I know the governor, myself, and everyone, uh, everyone else I know at the local government level has called for the federal government to, uh, I don't know if it's Dow or DuPont or whoever, or whatever chemical company would make that thing, needs to be told to make it uh, in mass quantities as soon as possible. All right, is there a question from WVXU? I was curious, with the uh, city facing a, a difficult budget for the new fiscal year that starts July the 1st, usually like public input is always a big part of that. Have you given any thought to what the public input process might look like, how that might be different for this upcoming budget since folks are not allowed to be at City Hall right now? No, I haven't really given it a great deal of thought. Uh, however, since you raised that issue, I, I do want to point out a, a few things. Um, this weekend and today, um, and I and, and mayors across the state, county commissioners across the state and the country uh, have been strongly advocating to Congress to include local government in this current bill that's supposedly going to be voted on this week. And as the Brookings Institution reported a couple weeks ago, Ohio has four of the five cities in the top 10, or top five, four of the five in the top five are most likely to be devastated financially. And Cincinnati, Ohio, our city, is number two on this list nationally. Columbus, Ohio, is number one. It's also interesting to point out, as I have many times, that Columbus and Cincinnati have the fastest growing economies in the state and have been for a long time. Uh, and are the only two cities, major cities, that will see an increase in the census if the census ever gets completed. And, um, and so if you think about Ohio's recovery, um, you know, they take taxes from us and distribute them throughout the state. Um, it is this metropolitan urban uh, growth that will fuel uh, all of Ohio's growth. And so there's no way that Cincinnati and Columbus or any city uh, can survive, either survive or thrive, uh, if, uh, if our local governments uh, suffer the catastrophic loss of revenue that we're all projecting right now. Let's not forget that, as the New York Times rep reporter Paul Kr Krugman put it recently, this is a, essentially a medically in, uh, induced coma that the federal and state government has put us under in order to save lives, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with it, but fundamentally it is uh, what, what they would call an unfunded mandate, uh, which is they're mandating a shutdown of the economy, which mandates a dramatic loss in tax revenues to local governments, and yet we're expected not only to provide basic services going forward, but to, to provide more dangerous basic services and more, more, more basic services, more police and fire overtime, more strain at a time where many of our cops and firefighters have to be quarantined, et cetera. As an article was written in the Columbus Dispatch over the weekend, uh, police and fire, all officers all over this country uh, will be laid off uh, if we don't get assistance from the federal government. While the city of Cincinnati doesn't at the current time believe that that is necessary for us, that's based on the current model of an $80 million deficit. The cuts that would be required to meet an $80 million deficit are devastating and devastating the quality of life, meaning you know there won't be any parks or recreation available at all. There wouldn't be yard waste pickup, as another example we talked about earlier today. And that's not a city any of us really want to, to be in. And the fact is that it's a short-term, hopefully, loss in revenue because we have to learn how to go back to work safely with this pandemic, or hopefully we get a vaccine. But if we don't get a vaccine, we still have to figure out how to go back to work safely. And so that, but that short-term change could take six months, could take a year, uh, and, and, the, and, and so the federal government is essentially ordering us to do these things the difference is they can print money and we can't print money. And so we want to emphasize over and over again, and for those of you at home looking for something to do 
in addition to all the other help that small businesses need, et cetera, the food banks need, if you want to live in a community that still has good basic services, police, fire, parks, recreation, please email Congress and our senators and ask them to include uh, the city local government fund, which is not just for cities but for counties. And in fact, the deal was struck over the weekend between the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National League of Cities, and the county uh, commissioner organization, NACO or something it's called. That's the acronym. I don't know what, exactly what it stands for. But the equivalent of the U.S. Conference of Mayors for county commissioners, whatever that's called. They cut a deal this weekend to make a joint request to Congress and to split the money up fairly on a, pro, on a per capita basis between rural, suburban, and urban counties and cities all across this country. Everyone needs it, Ohio in particular. And we really, really hope, um, we spoke to Senator Brown this morning. We spoke and reached out to Senator Portman multiple times over the weekend. Uh, I personally texted and or talked to directly to Congressman Shabbat and Wenstrup uh, and pushed uh, all of them uh, in this direction. In addition to that, I've asked and received uh, the assistance from the firefighters union, the police union. AFSME has been working on this for weeks and has been a great leader on this. Uh, and so we continue to push on this, and it, it seems only fair um, that, that, that cities be able to continue to provide those basic services that people need. All right, any other questions from the media today? Uh, Mayor Chris Blair again. Uh, can you say how much the city has spent on COVID-19 response so far? The county gave a number today. I was curious what the city's was. Uh, Mr. Wetter, this is Patrick Bahaney. I think currently right now we've spent probably between overtime and the purchase of PPE roughly around probably four to five million dollars and it's still incurring costs. And Patrick, is any of that reimbursable or, or anything at this point by federal funds or is it straight out of our local taxpayers' dollars? And I think as the mayor mentioned, the city has not received any like direct um, federal support from the, any of the stimulus dollars because we're under 500,000, right. but we did get enhanced revenue for CDBG and ESG and things like that. We're still working all that stuff out. Hopefully we can find a way to be reimbursed th from other sources rather than going back into the city coffers, which is currently being depleted. But at the moment right now, we're still working all that stuff out, Mr. Wetterick. Yeah, and Thank I, you. And, and on that point, and, and this is something that I think there's a great deal of confusion about even by our allies who are trying to help us. As uh, County President uh, uh, Denise Treehouse explained today, and I had heard the exact same language from uh, the mayor of Columbus, who is also a direct recipient of, of that first round of funding, the way the, the law was written does not give the flexibility to deal with revenue losses, which is obviously what's happening here. Um, and so, that, at a minimum, hopefully can be fixed by regu regulation or by a subsequent act of Congress, in addition to the fact that we need uh, the funding to be available to uh, cities and counties of all sizes uh, throughout the country. Any other questions today? Hi, hey, Mayor Stephen Albritton, WLWT. Quick question. I know you mentioned how um, cutting services uh, might be in the future. Is there a priority list that you guys have put together of what may come next and further down the line? And uh, second question, uh, you mentioned $80 million uh, as possible deficit. Is that the current number uh, as it stands today? Yeah, uh, so the first point is that we, we will be doing a budget in late May, early June, which is really not that far from now. So you'll see that list as with the best updated numbers at that time. Uh, obviously, as we've stated a number of times, the, uh, the things that we believe we must and should do uh, are police fire, um, sanitation, which is garbage collection, um, clean water, sewer services, you know, are obviously vital to a society and uh, will be our highest priorities. Uh, but there are many other things that are basic quality of life of cities, like I mentioned earlier, park and rec, uh, that 
uh, we would not be able to fund if we were to absorb the entirety of the $80 million projected deficit. And candidly, an $80 million deficit, if it becomes to fruition and we don't have any other options to deal with it, would impact police, fire, uh, uh, sanitation uh, in a variety of ways, whether or not that's layoffs is to be determined and, and, and hopefully not likely. But there will be diminishment of those services uh, in more ways than one if, um, if that were to come to pass. Just to answer your question more specifically, we're projecting an $80 million deficit starting July 1 to July 1. As was previously mentioned in round numbers, there's about a $20 million gap just to get through now and July 1st. So it's really a $100 million deficit over 15 months. I've noticed that, that that's been confusing in some of the reporting that, that the, the 15 to $20 million deficit is only for the next two and a half months. But we, you know, under current projections, we're looking at an $80 million deficit uh, on an annualized basis. And, and, and sadly, it, you know, it could be worse. Uh, hopefully it'll be better, but it 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 may not be it, it may not be it may be more than eighty million dollars. Thank you. Any other questions today? All right. Well, it's a beautiful day, so uh, try to safely enjoy that uh, with, with the appropriate physical distancing, and remember to consider donating to the Free Store Food Bank or to the United Way. Thank you very much. We'll see you on Wednesday.